Ladies and gentlemen, very good evening to you once again. Uh, we have with us now Right Honourable Lord Newberger of Abbotsbury, our guest keynote speaker. Uh, his CV is very well known to you. It's on the flyer that is before you. I'm going to keep this introduction incredibly short, and I'm going to pass you directly over to Lord Newberger. So. It, it, it has always seemed to me that once a talk lasts more than 20 minutes, there's a strong danger that many people in the audience lose the will to live. And if the talk lasts more than half an hour, there's a real risk that the speaker himself uh, finds himself in the somewhat same catatonic frame of mind. Questions and answers are more dynamic because they involve a much greater diversity of voice, character and topic. But somehow people feel shortchanged if they're invited to a talk and are then fobbed off with Q&A. So I was originally asked to talk for about 50 minutes today, but I negotiated it with 30, down to 35 minutes with questions uh, to follow. So please get ready with some questions, and they don't have to be related to anything I, I, I say. I also chose a title which seemed appropriate for a recently retired judge who's moved, tried to move into the world of international arbitration at a rather interesting, indeed some might say torrid, political time. This has the advantage of enabling me to try and reduce the boredom th or threshold uh, by covering two different topics, namely contrasting the judicial role uh, with the arbitral role and the effect of Brexit on arbitration in London. Turning first then to the roles of a judge and an arbitrator, Obviously, each of them has an absolutely fundamental duty to resolve and to be seen to resolve uh, the dispute before them honestly, fairly, and dispassionately. But there are very real distinctions uh, between the roles um, of a judge trying a case and an arbitrator resolving a dispute. And I think they all ultimately stem from the fact that a judge trying a case is a public figure engaged on a ultimately constitutional exercise with a duty owed to society. A judge, of course, also has duty to the parties, which is also a public duty. But whenever it clashes with his primary duty or her primary duty to society, it must yield to that primary duty. By contrast, an arbitrator has a purely private law duty to the parties, arising out of a contract, it's true that in almost all jurisdictions, an arbitrator's duty is made subject to certain statutory restrictions and requirements, which must by definition be in the public interest or else they wouldn't be in a statute. But those restrictions, I suggest, don't alter the essentially exclusive private law nature of an arbitrator's duty. Having been a judge in the United Kingdom for over 20 years, and now embarking on a career as an arbitrator, I have found this fundamental difference in the nature of the two roles has required a degree of uh, adjustment. The position is very different from the start. It of the, it's of the essence of litigation that the parties cannot select their judge. In a recent case, Mr Justice Mostyn emphasised that when it comes to getting a judge to recuse himself for apparent bias, as he put it, the bar is set high because otherwise litigants might be tempted to engage in preliminary exercises of judge picking. But of course, arbitrator picking is fundamental to the attraction of arbitration, particularly if they would have to litigate in a foreign court. Companies and individuals are often uncomfortable about having to accept whichever judge the court system of the country concerned selects, without the parties normally even having an opportunity uh, to be involved in the exercise. As a matter of principle, the difference between the way the tribunal is selected epitomizes the point uh, that arbitration is a consensual private arrangement, whereas litigation is a primarily public rule of law exercise. But I have to say it takes a little bit of getting used to for someone who for 21 years was foisted on the parties to litigation whether they wanted him or not. Now I'm put forward as a possible arbitrator, and the possibility of rejection which when it comes is almost always unexplained, is a new experience, but it's almost certainly very good for my soul if ex-judges or arbitrators have souls. <laughs> the, 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 the private consensual nature of arbitration as against the public rule of law nature of litigation 
has a number of other consequences which also require a degree of adjustment from an ex-judge. Thus it means arbitrators do not have the same role as judges in terms of policing the proceedings. From the very beginning of the arbitration process, the arbitrators and the parties are involved in an almost negotiation process as to the terms on which the arbitration will proceed, procedural directions and so on. Particularly following the reforms to civil litigation in England and Wales, which started around 20 years ago, English judges are expected to be much more involved and controlling in relation to the pre-trial process to ensure that cases are dealt with proportionately and to be pretty circumspect when assessing costs. The judges of the commercial court are, I think, generally less enthusiastic about this policing aspect of their role than judges in many other courts in England and Wales. But nonetheless, almost all UK judges now regard themselves as having a role to play in ensuring that proceedings do not get out of control, partly to protect all parties in relation to costs, partly because of the effect on other litigants, and partly to ensure that court time is not used up inappropriately. And that's as it should be, uh, as part of the rule of law in any country. Therefore, it's the judge's role to ensure that litigation is efficiently conducted. On that traditional view, at any rate, that's quite unlike arbitration, where the whole basis of the proceedings is contractual. To take an example, if there are two cases involving the same five parties, a judge may order them to be consolidated, treated as one case, even if none of the parties in either set of proceedings support the proposal. By contrast, if there are two arbitrations between the same five parties, it seems to me that they could not be consolidated, even if all three arbitrators and four of the five parties wanted that to happen. It would be open to any party to insist on its contractual right to have separate arbitrations, subject, of course, uh, to the rules of the relevant arbitral body if they apply. For the same sort of reason, there is a powerful argument that it's no part of an arbitrator's function to worry about the delay in the proceedings, the time a hearing is lasting, or the way in which the costs are being piled up, unless it gives rise to an issue between the parties which the arbitrator is called on to determine. After all, if the parties to an arbitration are content to drag the proceedings out, in the arbitrator's view unnecessarily, to have hearings which the arbitrator regards as unnecessary, to have masses of lawyers at a hearing which the arbitrator thinks only a couple are needed, it can be said with force that that's a matter for the parties. And when it comes to awarding costs, if both parties have done this, how can the paying party object to paying all such costs of the receiving party? It can be said that this throws a slightly, an indirect light on a slightly uncomfortable uh, aspect of arbitration. <coughs> That aspect that are, is that arbitrators often can be said to have a positive financial uh, interest in not objecting to proceedings being dragged out or to a proliferation of lawyers. Unnecessary or elongated hearings mean more money for the lawyers, but they also often mean more money for the arbitrators who are often, very often, paid by the hour. And if arbitrators start criticising lawyers' charges and working practices in an arbitration, or penalising a party in costs, they are likely to find that they are nominated as arbitrators in the future rather less frequently than they might hope. Now, I'm far from saying that many arbitrators are consciously influenced by such factors, but self-interest has a nasty habit of subconsciously encouraging one to make decisions in one's own self-interest. So long as arbitrators are not expected to control proceedings in the same way as judges, I suppose this is a relatively containable issue. An arbitrator will only be required to address uh, the question of whether any party was overdoing things if it's raised by another party. In such cases, the arbitrator's possible concern over further appointments will normally not apply because he or she will have to upset or please one party or the other. But I suspect and I certainly hope that the great majority of arbitrators would simply not be influenced by their own potential level of fees from particular arbitration. Nonetheless, Given the increasing importance of justice being seen to be done, there must be still some concern about the perception of self-interest nonetheless arising in such a case. As I've already indicated, the view that arbitrators are unlike judges in that they have no duty to ensure that an arbitration is conducted proportionately or efficiently, subject to the parties arguing about it, 
has real force. Public interest concerns such as the appropriate use of court time or availability of judges for other cases, and more generally, uh, the efficient use of public resources, uh, appear to have no part to play when it comes to arbitration. Equally, if both parties are prepared to drag the proceedings out or incur very substantial costs, on what ground, it might be said, can the arbitrator disapprove or seek to stop them, given that one of the founding principles of arbitration is that it is a consensual exercise. But there is a contrary view, namely that arbitration has become such a significant means of dispute resolution, both in terms of the sheer volume of arbitration and in terms of the types of dispute which are arbitrated, and arbitrations are not infrequently having significant ramifications for people across the world, that it's no longer realistic to treat arbitration as a purely private consensual exercise. Thus, when deciding investor state disputes, arbitrators are often making decisions which, to quote Robert French, the former Chief Justice of Australia, include awards which significantly impact on national economies and on regulatory systems within nation states. <coughs> And such decisions are also sometimes involve overruling national courts, even national supreme courts. Indeed, as Robert French went on to say, arbitral decisions in the ISDS cases have general implications for national sovereignty, democratic governance, and the rule of law within domestic legal systems. And at the other end of the spectrum, for example, there is growing concern in some quarters at any rate in the United States, and now more recently here, about the fact that employees are required to sign away their rights to go to court in return, for instance, for the right and indeed the obligation to arbitrate. The substantially increased public and global importance of arbitration can fairly be said to call into question the conventional view of the arbitrator as simply one of the parties to a private consensual arrangement who happens to have the responsibility of resolving the dispute, and to cast on an arbitrator a new, more public interest type judicial role compared with that which he or she had hitherto been assumed to enjoy. It can be, assumed, it, it, it can be argued that such a new aspect of arbitration is reflected by the requirements imposed on arbitrators by many of the arbitral institutions to proceed promptly with any arbitration and not to delay their awards unduly. However, I suspect that such requirements are imposed more because of the demands from individual parties to arbitrations, an aspect I touch on later, and to ensure that arbitration remains a popular form of dispute resolution rather than being imposed for public uh, policy reasons. There is undoubtedly false in the contention that arbitration is now such a common form of dispute resolution and so frequently far-reaching in its effect that there is a public interest in arbitrators having a more judge-like duty. But it seems to me that it would be very dangerous to run very too far with that view. As a matter of principle, any attempt to impose public law duties on arbitrators, at least in normal commercial uh, cases, whether national or international, uh, would represent an interference with the party's freedom of contract and the right of self-determination, and in the end, uh, the attraction of arbitration. Because it would, I think, carry the obvious at least, at least danger, but possibly a bit more than danger, of depriving <coughs> commercial arbitration of much of its attraction. I suggest a more principled and achievable middle way would be to identify certain types of arbitration in which some judge-like responsibilities could be placed on arbitrators. ISDS arbitrations may appear to be a fairly obvious example. And there are other disputes, such as those relating to large public procurement contracts, which may give rise to similar public interest concerns. Indeed, some countries recognize the special nature of awards in such disputes. The French courts, for example, have concluded that such awards uh, must be are reviewable by the administrative courts, and Brazilian statutory law requires such arbitrations uh, to be subject to public scrutiny. Otherwise, with these sort of exceptions, I think that we have to let the market function as its consumers want, which should lead to maintaining and improving the performance of arbitrators, as I shall discuss a little later.
Another substantial and well-known difference between arbitration and litigation is that arbitrations are almost always private and arbitration awards are almost, private, almost always private and unappealable, whereas court hearings are almost always public with judgments which are always published and appealable in principle. It's often said, and rightly said, that it's fundamental to the rule of law that court hearings take place in public and judgments are given in public. That's because the public should be able to see justice being dispensed and because public oversight helps ensure that judges behave themselves, that the rule of law is in safe hands. Sunlight, as was famously said by Justice Brandeis, is the best disinfectant. Judge in the, judges in the UK have, of course, been keen to support open justice. And when it was created in 2009, the UK Supreme Court exemplified this principle by ensuring that almost all its hearings were streamed so that they could be watched anywhere in the world. But we do not go so far as the Brazilian Supreme Court, which streams not only the hearings, but the judges' discussions about the case they have heard after it's over. As I rather self-consciously pointed out in a judgment, sunlight is the best disinfectant, but it can also burn. Arbitration is very different. And as in relation to the arbitrator's duties, save in relation to types of disputes where there is a particular public interest, there is a case which I think is very difficult to challenge, either in principle or in practice, that parties should be entitled to agree that their dispute resolution arrangements outside court, whether through arbitration or otherwise, are conducted in and are subject to complete privacy. As to ISDS disputes, a 2005 OECD report referred to a general understanding among the members of its investment committee that additional transparency, in particular in relation to the publication of arbitral awards, subject to necessary safeguards for the protection of confidential business and governmental information, is desirable to enhance effectiveness and public acceptance of international investment arbitration as well as contributing to the further development of a public body of jurisprudence. And most ICSID awards are published by consent and details of, the international, of ICSID arbitrations are required to be published. And the 2014 ancestral rules require most treaty-based ISDS awards to be published. But as I say, it's hard to justify denying strict privacy to all, or at least the great majority, of what might be called <coughs> purely commercial arbitrations, whether international or not. However, the consequence of the arbitral proceedings and award being entirely private can at least, in theory, operate as an incentive to discourage arbitrators from being fair or from applying the law, particularly if that would cause them to reach an outcome or decision which seems to them to be fair uh, in that particular case. Judges not infrequently find themselves making decisions which they do not want to make on the basis of the merits of their case as they see them uh, because the law, as the judge interprets it, requires the particular decision. Inevitably, the law sometimes favours a party who has behaved badly, even dishonest or dishonourably, over a party who has behaved well. And sometimes the proper application of the law produces an unattractive result, particularly on unusual facts. However, knowing not only that they are sitting and giving their decision in private, but also that any decision is likely to be unappealable, an arbitrator must often be tempted to cheat when an application of the law produces an unpalatable result. The strict view in law, at least in the common law world, is of course that an arbitrator should apply the law in the same way as a judge. The common law is not static, so that means the arbitrator can develop the law to a certain extent in the same way as a first instance, but no more than a, a, a first instance trial judge. But subject to that significant qualification, the traditional view is clear. An arbitrator is strictly required to apply the law. This is, I should say, a view to which I subscribe to myself. And at the risk of sounding somewhat judgy, I would suggest that an arbitrator who consciously gives a decision or makes an award which does not comply with the law as he understands it, would be acting quite wrongly. However, although that is my view, I can see an argument for saying that arbitrators should be entitled to be a bit more flexible and commercial in their approach. 
But I do think there is a real risk of an arbitrator faced with a very unpalatable conclusion as a result of applying the law, justifying not doing so on the basis that arbitration should be more flexible than litigation. In my view, that is a temptation which should be resisted. That's not so much, or at least not only, because uh, it is wrong in principle. It's for two other connected reasons. First, such an attitude will undoubtedly duly lead to serious abuses. Once an arbitrator decides that he or she is effectively above the law, the habit of ignoring the law is likely to be pretty quickly ingrained. Secondly, while departing from the law in the odd case may do little harm uh, to the reputation of arbitration, I believe that that reputation will be badly dented if people thought, start to think that arbitrators act on their own feelings and do not apply the law. As the Chinese have realized in the past 20 years, it's essential for a country to have an impartial dispute resolution system and for the rule of law uh, to prevail in order for business to thrive. And business people will in the long run be reluctant to enter into transactions subject to certain types of law without knowing that they will be interpreted and enforced according to that law. And in the long run, that's as true of arbitration as it is of litigation. Given that, particularly in a common law system, the law is developed to a significant extent by judges, the privacy factor in arbitrations removes the privilege and the responsibility which someone such as myself had as a judge making law. Indeed, such has been the success of arbitration that there is serious concern in some quarters that commercial law is at risk of ossifying because with the severe restriction on appeals, judges are not getting sufficient cases to enable them to develop the law through their judgments. This problem led Lord Thomas, when he was Lord Chief Justice, to suggest in a 2016 lecture that the present <coughs> tight restrictions on appeals should be loosened. Unless the proposal is limited to domestic arbitrations, I think it would seriously risk undermining London as a popular seat for in international arbitration. Although I think opinion is by no means unanimous, the prevailing view in the commercial world appears to be against appeals. That's supported by the fact that parties to an English arbitration agreement can agree in advance that whoever loses will have the right to appeal. But as I understand it, they very rarely include such an agreement. Even if Lord Thomas's proposal was implemented in relation to domestic arbitrations, it could, like so many proposals for change, have unexpected knock-on effects, such as driving some domestic arbitrations abroad. After 45 years in the law, I've come to realize that the most unfailingly reliable legal principle is the law of unintended consequences. That, that law, I think, is illustrated by one of the consequences of the restriction on appeals. Because disappointed parties cannot appeal on a substantive issue of law in the great majority of cases, they often seek to undermine an award, either by challenging it or by resisting its enforcement, on the grounds of some procedural defect or error. I do not suggest that restricting or precluding the right of appeal is the only cause of what is now perceived to be due process paranoia in arbitrations, but I have no doubt that it is a substantial factor. It means that arbitration, which used to be touted for its relative informality, has now become rather obsessed with process, rather more than litigation has. As a comprehensive survey in 2018, carried out by Queen Mary College and White and Case, uh, showed, uh, with over 920 written responses, uh, due process paranoia, they said, continues to be one of the main issues that users believe is preventing arbitral uh, proceedings from being more e efficient. One of the more paradoxical features of arbitration is the conflict between the privacy of the arbitral process and the ability to choose your arbitrator, both of which are thought to be, and understandably thought to be, so valuable. Given that arbitration is such a private business, it can be quite difficult to discover who is actually a good arbitrator, because arbitrations are subject to such stringent privacy rules. In this context, it's interesting to note, as reported in the Queen Mary White and Case summary, survey, uh, 
Many respondents wish to know more about individual arbitrators' case management skills and preferences, their degree of proactiveness, and other details of their level of involvement in the decision-making process. And many of the responses, those who responded thought that publishing awards was likely to provide valuable insight into individual arbitrators' general approaches, even where a degree of redaction is to be expected. And it's worth noting that although privacy is an important, attractive feature of arbitration over litigation, according to the survey, it ranks behind its most attractive feature, namely enforceability of awards, as well as avoiding specific legal systems and national courts, and flexibility and ability of the parties to select their arbitrators. That brings me to an aspect of arbitration which is not different from litigation, namely cost and slowness. When I started practice at the bar in London in 1975, arbitration was touted as being not only more informal, but also quicker and cheaper than litigation. I'm not sure that's any longer the case, particularly when it comes to cost. I think this is due to a number of factors, some good, some bad. A more professional attitude to arbitration, arbitration by litigation, like litigation, being seen more than it was as a profit centre by lawyers, inability to appeal on substantive issues, leading to greater concentration on procedural <coughs> issues, as I mentioned, and the greater interest generally in society in fairness, all of which has led to due process paranoia. I'm not going to pontificate this evening on how this problem should be solved, not least because so many of the attempts to cut the cost of litigation during my time as a judge seem to have had the opposite effect. My old friend, the law of unintended consequences, at work again. Having said that, if arbitration is to continue to thrive, something must be done to stem the costs. This view is reflected in the survey again when it states that cost continues to be seen as arbitration's worst feature, followed, it must be said, by lack of effective sanctions during the arbitral process, lack of power in relation to, the third, party, to third parties, and lack of speed. The survey uh, provides a convenient link to the second Brexit-related part of my talk, and you'll be glad to hear the shorter part of my talk. Uh, that's because the survey reports that more than half of the respondents think that Brexit will have no impact on the use of London as a seat. They believe that its formal structure, formal legal structure, is likely to remain unchanged and to continue to support arbitration. Having said that, a significant proportion of the respondents to the survey had a more specific view had a more pessimistic view, and less than 10% thought the Brexit would have a positive effect. Interestingly, the survey also reported that 70% of those questioned speculated that Paris will be the seat to benefit the most from any negative impact of Brexit on London. One of the reasons why, this second, why the second half of this talk is shorter than the first is that even now we do not know what the short-term or long-term Brexit arrangements will be. Indeed, uh, we don't even know for sure whether there will actually be a Brexit. <coughs> In a talk six weeks ago, I said that this situation was pretty surprising, given that we were leaving the EU in less than a month. I can say that it's even more surprising today, given that we were supposed to have leave, left the EU more than three weeks ago. Nonetheless, as the saying goes, we are where we are although I must add in this context, wherever that is. <laughs> I think that insofar as it has a detrimental aspect, the main effect of Brexit on the London arbitration world will be largely limited to what may be characterised as mood music. Up to now, the United Kingdom has been seen and rightly seen as a politically stable, internationally responsible and socially tolerant country wedded to the rule of law. And London has been perceived, again rightly, as the global centre for financial and legal services with an almost uniquely internationalist and commercially realistic outlook. Whatever its outcome, eventually, there's no doubt that the whole Brexit debate over the past three years has undermined some of those aspects in some quarters. It can be a matter of debate as to what extent this state of affairs is justified, but there's no doubt that it exists and it's understandable. Membership of the EU, and in particular of the single market and the customs union, has enhanced the UK, and London in particular, 
as a place in which to be based and which to do business. In the short term, the uncertainty created by the Brexit debate has served somewhat to undermine this perception, and this undermining has been reinforced by countries and cities which, quite understandably, want to take such parts as they can get of London's services industry. At the moment, the evidence is only really anecdotal, but so far as I can fairly assess the question from personal experience, discussions and news reports, I would say that there's been a real but not overwhelming reputational damage for the UK as a good place to, be, to do business and to London as the primary international centre for legal and financial services. And I would say there's been some, but again relatively limit, limited, specific damage in the form of businesses partially or even wholly relocating, and in particular in our context, dispute clauses not providing for London seat when previously they would have done. In my view, if we end up with a close alignment to the EU or with no Brexit and things settle down politically, I suspect that the longer term effects of David Cameron's Baldrick worthy, cunning and subtle referendum plan on London as a dispute resolution centre will turn out to be re relatively limited. Events which seem very significant at the time get swallowed up and minimised as, as with the passage of time. On the other hand, if the, EU crashes out, if the UK crashes out of the EU or the UK enters a period of real economic or political instability, then the risks of serious problems for the international and legal and financial service in, in London must inevitably be greater. But even then, while shortish term predictions can also often be expected to be pretty reliable, the longer term is almost uh, impossible to predict with any confidence. More particularly, when it comes to international arbitration, it's hard to identify a specific downside which any sort of Brexit would bring to London as a seat of choice. Indeed, in more than one respect, there are grounds for saying that almost perversely, Brexit should actually be good for London as an international arbitration and general dispute resolution centre. Thus, when it comes to the most attractive feature of arbitration over litigation, according to the survey I've referred to more than once, namely the easier enforceability of awards over judgments, it can be said that Brexit would, if anything, be positively helpful to arbitration. The enforceability of arbitration awards is, of course, based on the New York Convention, and that would continue to apply to a UK-seated arbitration uh, uh, just as much uh, 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 before, pre after Brexit as before. On the other hand, depending on the Brexit terms and negotiations with non-EU countries uh, 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 and EU countries, uh, judgments of the UK courts are maybe more difficult to enforce uh, within the EU and even possibly outside the EU uh, uh, than while the UK is an EU member. Unless the UK and the EU reach an agreement to the contrary, the present virtually automatic mutual uh, enforcement arrangement under so-called Brussels recast between different members of state courts will fall away so far as the UK is concerned. Accordingly, faced with a choice between arbitration or litigation in London, a company or individual interested in international enforcement might be more attracted post-Brexit to arbitration uh, than currently. There are two other technical aspects which occur to, occur to me. First, depending on the extent to which Brexit frees the UK from aspects of EU law, UK courts may well be able to resume their previously widely implemented power to issue anti-suit injunctions at staying litigation outside the UK where it conflicts with a binding agreement to arbitrate, even in relation to EU member states. At the moment, of course, the power to grant anti-suit injunctions in relation to litigation in other EU member states is constrained, albeit that the full extent of the constraint under Brussels recast is not entirely clear. If a UK court in the future had an unconstrained ability to grant an anti-suit injunction in respect of EU-based litigation, then that would represent an advantage for a London seat as compared with a Paris or Stockholm seat. Then there's the effect of the Luxembourg Court of Justice's ACMIA decision, which appears to invalidate any arbitration agreements which would enable arbitral tribunals to reach binding decisions on issues of fundamental EU law, at least insofar as the agreement is binding on a member state of the EU. For reasons which I find a little hard to fathom, 
the Court of Justice has suggested that this ruling does not apply to arbitration agreements to which no EU member state is a party. Uh, and I also don't understand why they could not have limited it more simply to say that uh, any arbitration decision which raised an EU point uh, could, whatever statute provided, uh, be appealed to a court. Nonetheless, we are landed at the moment with the ACMEA decision. Once uh, it, 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 we had left the EU, subject to what we agreements we had made with the EU, it would not appear to apply to a UK-seated arbitration but it would still presumably be applied by EU domestic courts in relation to proceedings uh, brought b within an EU member state to enforce a UK seat award. But the ACMEA decision would no longer apply to arbitration agreements to which the United Kingdom was a party. More broadly, if and insofar as there is a risk of a UK court referring a point on an arbitration appeal to the Court of Justice, if this has been seen as a negative factor when it comes to London as an arbitration seat, and I suspect it's a bit too recherche a point uh, to do that, that too would be a factor which would presumably uh, disappear if and when the UK leaves the EU. There is a different and faintly interesting question relating to the role of English law as the contractually applicable law as opposed to making London the EU seat of the, arbit the, seat of the arbitration. I, I do not detect that the influence of substantive EU law or even human rights law on English law has either reinforced or undermined the attraction of English law as the applicable law to international commercial contracts. Accordingly, if EU law ceases to apply to the UK, I think that one would expect it to be unlikely to either help or detract London as a venue for arbitrations. More broadly, there is a belief among some people that's reflected in the responses to the survey that London will be a less attractive place for non-British lawyers and arbitrators to visit, and that it will have a less impressive cadre of potential arbitrators and lawyers. I'm very sceptical about that fear, but it's not a c c concern I can confidently deny. It seems to me to be based on supposition, and if it's right, it'll be a slow process, during which a host of other relevant and unforeseen events could occur. But it is a concern which is part of a wider uh, perception, namely that many British people fear that the Brexit story so far is diminishing this country's self-respect at home and its standing abroad, and that as things unfold, both aspects will get worse. Nonetheless, it's a striking fact that this country has never been uh, in a higher position in the UN World Happiness Index than it is in 2019. As the late and great historian and essayist Tony Jutt once famously said, the English are the only people who can experience schadenfreude at their own misfortunes. Thank you very much. Thank you.